Okay. <laughs> this is so funny and weird. Just a few of you joining me in Zoom land and all the rest of you lovely people in the hall. Can you hear me okay, everyone? Yes, good, excellent. <laughs> and I have gallery view on. I don't know if that's affecting you guys in the hall. I don't know if you can see this normally. <sighs> this is an exercise in technological faith. <laughs> So, you know, as, um, as things open up, uh, one of the things we're really encountering is just the, the, the beauty and uh, mystery of individuals and their differences. You know, I, I work in a hospital. I have a husband and a brother who are in high risk. Uh, so, so I'm not yet ready to come into the hall unmasked. Um, I'm ready to be outside. <laughs> but here I am back in Zoom land anyway. So just, uh, Ejo has said this before, and just this reminder to be super gentle with each other and with ourselves uh, as we navigate this strange time, right? Navigate a time of openness and also ongoing curiosity and restriction and whack wackadoodleness. That's the, the technical Zen term, the wackadoodleness that is us right now. So that's all probably connected to what I want to talk about today anyway, because I mean, everything's connected. But I want to talk about stillness and turbulence today and uh, really inspired by the series of talks that Edjo introduced last week, which if you, if you didn't hear his talk or even if you did, I encourage you to, to go to SoundCloud or Vimeo and, and listen to it again or listen to it for the first time. Um, but I want to start out today with two images, an image of stillness and an image of turbulence. So the image of stillness is one that's probably familiar to many of us. It is said that when Shakyamuni, the sage of the Shakya clan, sat down beneath the Bodhi tree, uh, dedicating himself to uh, clarifying the great matter of this birth and death, to clarifying the, the, the meaning, the truth, the reality of suffering. It is said that he sat so still when he took up that diamond seat, that seat that could not be shaken. He sat so still that not even the hems of his robes moved in the wind. Complete non-separation of self and world, a stillness so absolute that we are completely apart, not apart from, but a part of the world. So still, not even the hems of his robes moved in the breeze. It's an image of the undivided mind, an image of non-separation. Now the image of turbulence, it comes from an image that uh, Edjo shared last week. Uh, I also am a great fan of the 1997 film Contact. <laughs> if you guys didn't leap to Netflix to watch it last week, maybe I will encourage you to do some binging. Uh, yeah, Jodie Foster. So, you know, I won't spend too much time recapping what Edjo recapped from this film, but uh, the image comes from uh, when Jodie Foster's character is in this capsule, this completely round spherical capsule that has been built according to plans sent by, we think, benevolent aliens, maybe, maybe benevolent from another more advanced race, another more advanced species. And they've built that capsule according to those plans, except they've built within it a seat to hold Jodie Foster's character, to hold her tight because they don't trust that without a seat, she can be in the capsule. So she locks herself in, as, as Edjo pointed out, there's this big breastplate, she locks herself in, completely guarded, completely held down. And then the capsule is released and it starts to vibrate, it starts to shake. 
it's not part of the original plan. It's vibrating with the movement, the energy of the capsule, and it's vibrating, it's shaking, gets more and more and more and more intense. And finally, Jodie Foster releases the breastplate, releases the hold, and floats into now a silent, still space. Edger was talking about that image of turbulence in terms of the ways in which through our fear, through our guardedness, through our much needed sense of self-protection, self versus world, we try to lock things down, right? We wanna hold things tight. We wanna nail down the world. We want to fix the world and in both senses of the word fix, right? That's a, it's a wonderful term, fix, right? Fix, we, we wanna repair what's broken, like the world needs our repairing, right? And we also want to fix things down. We wanna hold everything stable and solid. So that turbulence that Jodie Foster is feeling, right? An effort to hold things still, to separate and hold tight the self in response to the world. Now, on the face of it, these two images, the image of stillness, the Buddha sitting so still that not even the, the hems of his robes move in the breeze, and Jodie Foster's character <sighs> moving turbulently out of an effort to hold things still, to hold things tight, to fix things. On the face of it, these two images seem completely opposite, right? Does that make sense? They seem completely opposite. Undivided mind, the mind that holds, the mind that protects, that safeguards, that defends. They seem completely opposite. But what I wanna to suggest today is that, in truth, these are the same image. If we take turbulence seriously enough, if we take our turbulence seriously enough, we find the stillness of a sitting Buddha. And this taking stillness, uh, sorry, taking turbulence seriously enough, I've started to call the path of resistance, <laughs> right? Okay. Quick, quick check-in, sound still okay? Everything's still good? Okay, I'm gonna take a sip of water. I have to narrate what I'm doing here in Zoom land, just, just in case, because <laughs> I'm talking about undivided mind, but wow, nothing's quite as weirdly div divisional as our digital uh, interfaces with the world. But if we take that turbulence of our life seriously enough, if we take the path of resistance seriously enough, we find the stillness of a sitting Buddha. So this path of resistance, now I, I think most of us are probably familiar with the phrase, the path of least resistance, heard that phrase. Uh, we use that phrase all the time, you know, basically the path of least resistance. It's like, you know, water seeking its level going downhill, a sense of the natural order of things, you know, that things flow down, they don't rise up generally. This is just simple physics. The universe, the universe we're told and we can observe with our eyes and our bodies, the universe wants to conserve energy, right? In general, the, the things of the universe take the least encumbered route. Uh, this is the second law of thermodynamics, y'all, right? This is the law of the universe moving from greater order and complexity to more randomness. This is, this is entropy right? You know, a block of ice placed on a stove will surely melt. The stove will surely get colder. The law of thermodynamics, entropy, the path of least resistance. The universe wants to conserve its energy. This is natural law. Things go with the flow. So that's the path of least resistance, right? We, we conscious beings, we, especially us humans, us big brained humans, us homo sapiens sapiens, we also uh, have a way of taking the path of least resistance. And the law that best describes us is not so much the second law of thermodynamics that may describe us as physical elements in the world of uh, entropy, but the law that best describes us as conscious beings, we might call it, well, the Dharma, we might call it the Four Noble Truths. There is suffering, there is 
a cause of that suffering, there is the cessation of that suffering, and there is a path to that cessation. What the Buddha discovered when he was sitting so still under the Bodhi, Bodhi tree is that there is a cause of our suffering, right? That's what he discovered in his stillness. And that cause is our clinging, right? Or the Sanskrit term tanha. We want what we want and we don't want what we don't want. And we're determined to hold on <laughs> to what we want for dear life and to push away, to fix, to nail down, to preserve what we want and to push off what we don't want. Uh, we're, we're sticky beings, right? That's what the second law, the second noble truth tells us. Uh, the stickiness is actually the stickiness with which, in fact, we resist the impermanence around us. We might even say that our stickiness, our second law, not the second law of thermodynamics, dynamics, but the second noble truth, our great law is that actually we resist the natural path of least resistance, right? We resist the impermanence of the world around us. Does this make sense? We resist the path of least resistance. Now the ancient Greeks, they understood this well. About 300 years after the historical Buddha, after he sat under his tree so still that not even the hems of his robe moved, about 300 years later, a guy named Zeno from Cyprus, not, not the same Zeno who comes later, who is the guy with the paradoxes and the arrow and all that stuff. Not that Zeno, different Zeno, earlier Zeno, Zeno from Cyprus. About 300 years after the historical Buddha sat under his tree, Zeno from Cyprus was shipwrecked. He was a very wealthy, wealthy man. He was leaving Cyprus and he was shipwrecked. He lost everything. And he came to the conclusion that happiness comes <laughs> when we don't hold things tightly, you know, when we ready ourselves for things like shipwrecks, or as the poet Adrian Rich says, there'll be turbulence. It's a quote from a poem of hers called Turbulence. There'll be turbulence, there will be shipwrecks. And Zeno from Cyprus said, yeah, yeah. And founded the doctrine that came to be known as Stoicism. Um, a later Stoic, um, someone who's about 300 years after Zeno, Epictetus, he formulated things by saying, look, you know, the path of happiness is to live according to nature and not just to live according to nature, but to will to live according to nature, to want what the natural order brings, which, you know, actually requires a lot of work living according to nature. Our path of least resistance <laughs> is to resist the nature, uh, the natural path, right? Our path of least resistance as humans, as homo sapiens sapiens, is to resist a world where, as our ancestor Dogen says, when that a world where flowers fall even though we love them and where weeds flourish even though we hate them. And here, of course, is the source of dukkha. We're back to the noble truths that our path of least resistance resists nature's path of least resistance. So, just to go back to Epictetus. So he says, keep your will in accordance with nature. Uh, as pretty much everyone everywhere says nowadays, it is what it is. You all heard that saying before 100,000 times perhaps. It is what it is. So our human job is somehow to want what is. We resist the entropy of the world, trying to keep our systems in perpetual motion, trying to keep ships from wrecking, capsules from shaking, airplanes from encountering turbulence. And what we actually don't realize, and here's what the Stoics understood, what we don't realize is that the turbulence we're encountering is our own resistance. The turbulence is our own resistance. Now, a lovely poet, Jane Hirschfield, she's a, actually a Zen practitioner, um, wrote a poem called A Cedary Fragrance. It's a short poem. And uh, I'm 
all but certain, I'm certain without knowing this for certain, that she wrote this poem about um, uh, her time at Tassajara Monastery. So A Cedary Fragrance by Jane Hirschfield. Even now, decades after, I wash my face with cold water, not for discipline, not for memory, nor the icy awakening slap, but to practice choosing to make the unwanted wanted. Even now, decades after I wash my face with cold water, not for discipline, nor memory, nor the icy awakening slap, but to practice choosing to make the unwanted wanted. Live in accordance with nature. Keep your will in accordance with nature. Practice making the unwanted wanted. Now, Epictetus and others went on to say that it is actually in our nature as Homo sapiens sapiens with these huge, have I mentioned this before? Our brains are huge. With these huge brains of ours, it's actually in our nature to be able, <laughs> to will, to live in accordance with nature. It's in our nature to find harmony. We have big old brains that can learn to resist our own natural resistance. The scientists, the cognitive scientists call this our executive function and it's right here, prefrontal cortex folks, right? We have big brains, it's in our nature to learn to resist the resistance. For the Stoics, this was all about the practice of virtue as they define virtue. For the Buddhists, we might call this, uh, or some of it at least, the Eightfold Path. Live in accordance with nature, find that harmony. Well, this is the quality of equanimity. It's one of, in Buddhism, it's one of the four divine abodes, Brahma, one of the four Brahma Viharas, equanimity. It's a magical and fabulous life giving practice, the practice of equanimity. But it's not the whole story, right? Now, I've been talking in this um, discussion about living in accordance with nature, about the ways in which we can practice resisting our own resistance, right? I've been talking about that. The, the Sanskrit term for what I'm describing is naroda. This is cessation. This is what the third noble truth is about, that the way uh, to relieve our suffering is from the practice that learns to resist our resistance, that learns to release, to let go, not to hold on so tightly. But this isn't the end story, right? In the Mahayana school, we have uh, teachings around cessation that um, Ajo describes, I think, when he speaks with us about relinquishment. Um, living in nature brings equanimity. The scales of our, heart, of our heart find their balance and ease, right? Equanimity, I mean, what that word literally means is uh, the animus, the soul, the heart being equal on both sides. But the Mahayana, our school of Buddhism, uh, in finding stillness, right? the stillness of the Buddha, equanimity is not enough. It's good, but not enough. I mean, we learn this equanimity so quickly when we come to meditate, right? I mean, it begins with the most simple instruction of all, don't move, <laughs> right? Sit down, don't move. Try not to move, right? Anyone get that instruction when you first started to meditate? I give it to my mindfulness folks all the time. I'm like, just try not to move, right? Try not to push and pull. Try not to fix, to nail down, not the body in its discomfort, not the heart in its churning, not the mind in its swirling. Just stay put. And when we practice that, that, 
practice of stillness, of not moving, of resisting our own resistance, our own natural impulse to push and pull, to fix, to nail down. When we practice that, oh my gosh. I grew up in a world of fighting, my family, <laughs> love them, <laughs> but a world of fighting. And to taste that equanimity, oh my gosh. To have a taste of peace, of ease, of giving up the fight, of learning that I can resist my own, my own resistance, what, what bliss. I remember, um, you know, maybe about five years into having taken up a daily practice, maybe it was less than that, I don't remember, but I was at a session, I was at a meditation intensive at Great Val, and we were sitting, and we were sitting, and we were sitting, uh, and I remember Chosen, one of the abbots uh, at Great Val, and she was, in her, in her talk, she was describing the ways in which the voices, <laughs> I don't mean like, you know, losing your mind voices, but just the voices in the head, right, that emerge. And she was saying, you know, you can just tell those voices, not now, not now. The voice speaks up and says, oh, get up, go get a glass of water. Oh, my knee. Oh, I'm so bored. Oh, I'm dying here. All those little voices. And you can just say, okay, kiddos, I hear you, but not now. And so I remember sitting in the meditation period after that instruction to like, you know, just hear my voices, but don't act on them. They're just little kids. <laughs> They're just like. Mm -mm. And I remember feeling the, the ache in my knee and my left knee and thinking, OK, I want to move, but I, I don't have to. I don't have to. I don't have to. And just <sighs> relieving that tension of I got to move now that urgency that arises, that, that clinging sensation, that stickiness of the, the cause of suffering, tanha, feeling it arise and just, I, I don't have to act on it. And ah, Naroda, cessation, the pain just disappeared. The room, my heart, everything seemed to expand and open, right? Equanimity. What a beautiful thing. I did not know before that moment that I didn't have to fight. At a deep bodily level, I didn't know that I didn't have to fight. It's beautiful equanimity. And yet, if we think that we are going to find the stillness of the Buddha under the Bodhi tree by resisting our own resistance, we are missing something big. In fact, we're missing everything. Right? Resisting our own resistance. If we think that's the path toward the stillness that we yearn for, for the undivided mind, if we think that's the path, holding everything still, resisting our resistance, we're leaving out the very heart of this life. And in fact, you know, the instruction isn't don't move. The instruction is don't move. But when you don't move, notice what arises, right? That's the instruction. Notice what arises. Even Chosen's instructions about, you know, our voices like little kids, what, what compassion is embodied in that stance, what kindness. It's not pushing away our resistance, it's in fact learning to open into it. When we resist our resistance in a certain way by noticing rather than by uh, pushing down, right? Our whole, our whole lives open up. But what I wanna say is that that turning toward, that embodying, uh, isn't exactly the same as cessation in the classic sense. Pause for a sip of water. Sound quality still okay? Okay, so I have a, a terrible joke. <laughs> I have a terrible joke for you guys. And this is going to be impossible to do now unless someone in the hall shouts out the answers. Knock, knock. Who's there? Zeno. 
Z no evil, hear no evil, see no evil. <laughs> okay, let me take another pass through the land of knock knock jokes at everything I've been saying so far. This conscious life of ours, the path of least resistance for us, this conscious life of ours is a knock knock joke. Phenomena arise, knock knock. Right? And we want to answer that door, right? We want to answer that door and find out what it is, what's on the other side of the door. Here I am, answer the door. Who is there? What is it, right? We want to open the door to shut the door, right? We want to allow the phenomenon to arise. We notice it, it's separate. Threshold has been maintained. Knock, knock. What is it? Who's there, right? This is, this is our conscious life, a knock-knock joke, and not always at all funny, right? Now, last week, Ejo invited us into this practice, the practice of Zazen, the practice of the Buddha, of the Buddha Dharma, the practice of the Mahayana. He invited it, us into it as a kind of antidote to that, what is it, who's there, that act of nailing things down of the knock-knock joke. He invited us to instead consider this practice, not as what is it, let me find out, but just as what? Our Zazen is embodying this open-ended, right? Practice of inquiry, of exploration. What? Right? A what that is like, uh, to use an image that uh, Zen, the Zen teacher at Pacific Zen Institute, John Tarrant, who some of you might know, is sort of a Jungian, a kind of Rinzai, Soto, um, expansive kind of hybrid teacher. He's written a lot on koans. Uh, John Tarrant says, you know, this uh, open-ended, uh, intimate practice of inquiry right? Not the practice of resisting the resistance, but a practice of inquiry that Zazen can embody. Zazen is the mudra of the posture, the asana of what? He says, it's like, you know, when we stick our hand in, in our pocket, and in that moment when your fingers touch something, and, you know, you know whatever's in your pocket, you put it there, or somehow it's your pocket after all. So there's that sense of a kind of intimate strangeness when it's like, well, what is that? But before that hmm, gumdrop, penny, key, I don't know, lint, whatever it might be, a piece of chicken, I don't know, whatever you put in your pockets for goodness sake, before there's that nailing down, there's just that kind of, hmm, what? This uh, kind of charming encounter with what is intimate and strange. That quality of what? Intimate strange, curious, what, what? This is not the what that seeks to close down the knock, knock joke, right? Knock, knock, what is it? This is not a what that's in response to a knock. The what, mm, that kind of squinchy eyed, <laughs> I don't know why I think squinchy eyed, but that kind of, mm, what is it? That what before this side of the door, that side of the door. It's not the what that comes in response to the knock. This is the what that is the knock itself. This is the what that is the knock itself. Zazen as the posture of the world calling us, the world knocking at the heart of this self we think is separate. Now I use the word call here uh, with all of the awareness that calling uh, has a kind of religious ring to it. Uh, the world is calling us all the time. How could it not be? 
the world is knocking at our door. And yet, coming back to turbulence, we want to resist the call. In fact, we Buddhists tend, to, I think, to shy away from a notion of being called. It seems too theistic, too dualistic, too Abrahamic, maybe. It may be too much the way that the Abrahamic faiths define their sense of the sacred. Uh, you know, the, the, I mean, I speak as someone who really identifies very strongly with an uh, Abrahamic worldview, as well as my non-dualist uh, Buddhist heart. But, you know, I think there's that powerful knock-knock joke of knock-knock who's there, God, right? One thing we can learn from uh, the Abrahamic faiths, I think, is how and why it is that we resist the call. The world is calling all the time, calling us into the dance of all things, isn't it? All the time. And yet we resist. We hold tight. And we even try to uh, resist our resistance as a way of not holding so tight, not fighting so much. We, we long for that stillness that is being completely one with the whole dance, and yet we resist. I'm suggesting that in some of the great stories in the Abrahamic faiths, in uh, Judaism, in Christianity, in Islam, some of the great stories help us understand what it is to resist this call, this call of the universe. So my favorite, um, if you don't mind me sharing a brief little Bible story, my favorite is Jonah. How can you not love a fella who ends up in the belly of a whale, right? So I'm going to just quickly tell us a little Bible story. Hopefully, hopefully this won't be too, too much like Sunday school. Goodness. So Jonah, he's called by God to go preach to the wicked people of Nineveh, to tell them about God, to invite them to change their ways. And you know, Jonah's a good man, right? But he's like, no, <laughs> no, I'm going to Tarshish. I'm going to go in the entire opposite direction. I'm not going to Nineveh. Think about Jonah, uh, like from the standpoint of our modern polarized world. So God is saying to him, go preach to those wing nuts. And Jonah's saying, oh, no, not to the wing nuts over there. No, they won't understand. And you, God, are a merciful God. And I actually don't want them to uh, just get off the hook for what they've been doing, for their shenanigans. No, no mercy for the wing nuts. So Jonah, he's a good man. He's a righteous man. He gets on a ship. Many of you probably know where this is going. Uh, the ship is about to be subject to a shipwreck, just like Zeno of Cyprus. Only this shipwreck, we're told, comes from the will of God uh, because Jonah is not abiding. Jonah is resisting the call. So the folks on the ship say, what are we going to do? Jonah says, ah, you know, it's kind of my fault. Just throw me overboard. He ends up in the belly of a whale. He prays. God releases him, spits him up onto the shores of Nineveh, where Jonah preaches. The king repents. God relents. And Jonah is pissed off. He's like, I knew, I knew you would do this, God. I knew you would forgive the wing, wing nuts. I knew they wouldn't have to make amends for what they've done. I knew they wouldn't have to really change. I knew you're just a merciful God. And God said, well, of course I am. They're part of the whole dance, Jonah. I, I'm paraphrasing the Bible here, folks, but that's essentially what the, the God of the Old Testament says. They're part of it. They're part of this creation. They're part of the whole dance. Okay. So what is this story about? Why am I sharing it with you? In going to Tarshish, uh, Jonah is aware of what it is to be a good man to live a life like the Stoics, a life in accordance with nature. And he knows that there is this other thing. Uh, in, you know, sort of biblical language, we call it mercy. In the language of Buddhism, we call it the universal gateway of compassion. The life of resisting resistance is not enough. The pathway of the virtuous action, the virtuous stoic, is not enough. What the story of Jonah is about 
is understanding this other thing, this universal gateway of compassion. There'll be turbulence. That's what Adrian Rich says. Our discipline will never be great enough, right? We'll never be able to climb high enough to fly above the turbulence high enough to overcome what's shaking us because our efforts to overcome it try to pull us out of the very circumstances of this life. We don't sit still like a Buddha by simply trying to resist our resistance. That's like trying to avoid Nineveh. That's like trying to go to Tarshish. That's like trying to go the path of virtue, the path of righteousness in the biblical setting. That's like trying to lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps. So I want to close with Adrian Rich's poem, Turbulence. It's short. Here goes. Turbulence. There'll be turbulence. You'll drop your book to hold your water bottle steady. Your mind, mind has mountains, cliffs of fall. May who ne'er hung there, let him watch the movie. The plane's supposed to shudder, to shoulder on like this. It's built to do that. You're designed to tremble too. Else break. Higher you climb, trouble in mind, lungs labor, Heights hurl vistas, oxygen hangs ready overhead. In the event, put on the child's mask first. Breathe normally. We're designed to tremble, to hold on for dear life, to try to save our water bottle by letting her book drop, right? Trying to hold this steady, pushing that away, to make the ridiculous decision if if I could just If I could just grab on here, it doesn't. We try to resist our way to stillness. We try to climb out of the turbulence of our lives. And that's a good thing. That resisting, that resisting resistance, that effort to escape the turbulence, because it teaches us about this airplane we call life, about this great vehicle, the Mahayana. It it teaches us to climb higher, to seek the vistas, to learn the extent of our lungs and our hearts and our minds. But don't forget this plane is supposed to shudder and you're designed to tremble too. The plane's supposed to shudder, shoulder on like this. It's built to do that. You're designed to tremble too. This human life of ours, it's a holy mess. Thank goodness. Okay, let me, let me stop there and see if we have time for one or two questions or comments. And uh, if you're outside and you wanna just step up onto the, the deck, the Angawa, please do. If you're online, just unmute yourself. If you're in the hall, just shout out Yes, you're going to have to speak loud because I can't hear you. Yo, Boon. Yes. Uh, can you say something about, um, it seems like we're learning a lot as a culture about important kinds of resistance. Uh, something that's very active and gritty and can feel, maybe you can have marks of aggression and marks of discomfort, marks of really uh, showing up and meeting difficult situations uh, that can feel maybe not like a peaceful, loving Buddhist in one sense, not mesh so seamlessly with that image we're offered often. So can you say something about um, facing our resistance to that kind of resistance, even though we know it's so important? Yeah. So one of the things I'm saying in today's talk is 
there's no way around resistance. There isn't. Resistance is our learning about the dance. So how do we do that with integrity and wholeheartedly? You know, the, the, the taste of equanimity that we develop in this practice where we do actually uh, try to hold still. We make the ridiculous gesture of trying to hold onto our water bottle and dropping the book to use the image from Adrienne Rich's poem. The equanimity we develop is crucial because we have to actually see what we're sitting with. But to imagine that somehow there's a world where there's not the experience of resistance. I mean, maybe. I, I, I don't know what that life would be. Uh, I think our brains are too big to mean there won't be this rub. So in the political arena, right, how do we fully, fully experience what's going on? We have to start there. And then, you know, for me, it's, it's almost an article of faith that when we sit in the midst of the heart inside that goes, no, you know, like Jonah, no, not those wing nuts. When we really face that, which can feel like being in the freaking belly of the beast, the action arises. Uh, if, you, if you care to, if this is at all interesting, I'd say go to, to the book of Jonah and read the prayer that comes out of his heart in the belly of the beast. It's beautiful. It arises. Action arises. And we got to allow the turbulence to have its place in us, as us. And again, Joe, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's the best I got. Maybe time for one more. Rekha. I don't know if I have a really well-formed question, but um, in, I was trying to, um, come come to some kind of circle with where you opened and the image of the Buddha sitting so still that not even their robes moved in the wind and then closing with um, uh, embodying a position in nature where we need to shudder. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to reconcile those two images and I was wondering if you could speak in into that um that closing bringing those two images together what comes to mind I don't know that this will resonate for that many people in the assembly but it's what comes to mind if you've ever done shosan which is that very very formal ceremony where Uh, the abbot, Ejo, in our case, stands in the embodying the place of the Buddha and where students approach him and ask the question of their heart. For me, the experience of Shosan as a student approaching the Buddha is my whole being is shuddering. Has anyone ever experienced that? You bring your question forth and that sense of just... everything that this life is in that moment. Not every question, not every shosan feels that way, but, but when, I can, when I can really arrive. So that's my best image of how to live the truth of this moment. And it can feel like shuddering and yet completely arriving in that heartbeat. Yeah bringing our truth. We're, we're, built, we're built to do that. We're built to do that. So let's uh, intone the refuges together. <laughs> 